All right, I think we're good to get started here. Well, hey everybody, thank you so much for joining. Very happy to have you all here today. This webinar is brought to you by Cropster and by Nordic Approach Specialty Green Coffees. Um, my name is Taylor, I'm with Cropster, and uh, the Nordic Approach team was absolutely instrumental in making this webinar happen today. In particular, uh, she's not here uh, on video with us right now, but Susie Hoven um, was absolutely crucial in making this all happen. And also Morton is here with us as well from uh, Nordic Approach. So what is happening today in uh, this webinar? Well, we brought along some highly informed people to dive deeper into a topic that many of us have heard about, but it may be still mostly unknown. So why are we covering this and what are we doing? Well, in the past few years, terms like anaerobic fermentation, carbonic maceration, uh, skin contact, um, extended fermentation, these have become common in the specialty coffee community. Uh, and these terms have found their ways onto coffee bags, onto the offer lists of importers, um, but there's still much to be uncovered about what these processes mean and, and what's being done. So how are we gonna approach this today? So today we brought with us two roasters. Um, those roasters are Dima Varodai from the Welder Catherine and Lex Weneker from Freed Hats. Very happy to have them. And we also brought along um, three different producers from two different farms. Uh, and those producers um, are Kingsley Griffin from King Hawk, and he's coming to us from Uganda. And we also have Natalia and Andre coming to us from Jaguara in Brazil. So um, today we're going to dive into what these new terms mean uh, and the science behind these processes and what this means for the roaster when approaching these coffees. Um, just before we get any further, please feel free to ask your questions in the chat. We have that Zoom uh, chat, so make sure to find that. If you have any questions, we'll be answering those at the end of the chat. And for anybody who's joining us um, speaking the Russian language and prefers to use that, please enter your questions into the chat uh, and we will have uh, a team from Nordic Approach follow up with you with those questions. Also, any other language, please feel free to enter your questions into the chat and we will do our best to answer those. All right, so um, before we go any deeper into this conversation, I wanna bring in Morton. Um, Morton, there's a lot of these terms uh, floating around. We mentioned extended fermentation, carbonic maceration, anaerobic fermentation. Um, maybe, Morton, you can talk to us a little bit about um, what these terms are and what these terms mean. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, great to be here. Um, so, uh, you know, like, I don't know, you saw the first slide with uh, lots of uh, different names um, uh, thrown in there. Um, but before we start on that, I mean, I would say, like, uh, I think this is cool. I mean, it's uh, if you look at Nordic seven to ten years ago, we wouldn't uh, touch these coffees. I mean, we did some naturals and thought that was good, but you know, like when it came to the super extreme fermentations and stuff, we were uh, not really into that. But uh, have changed uh, uh, radically the last two years, and now we're really embracing it. And I personally also, I think it's uh, it's uh, super cool. Um, and I, I really love to, you know, like I've seen so many kind of flavors in coffee now that I didn't know existed like 10 to 20 years ago. So that's, uh, that's amazing. But I mean, there's also a lot of uh, weird and <laughs> what I would call like bad stuff out there, uh, you know, like uh, through, you know, like different kind of uh, crazy processes. So, so, but, but that's, um, that's, that's uh, a different thing. But um, what the problem is, is that I think we're all a little bit confused because there's like so many names, uh, you know, like that, uh, that uh, people use. So producers have their way of, uh, of uh, naming these kind of uh, things. And then roasters develop their own names. Importers, we're using our own names. So it's confusing. It's confusing to us. I think it's confusing to, to everyone, really. Um, so what we have, uh, what we have done uh, in Nordic is to try to, let's say, categorize uh, the way uh, these coffees are processed, but also, um, you know, like the way we're using these different uh, terms and names for the, for the, for the fermentation and, and processing methods. So if you look at this slide, um, we are talking about like two different things. So we have what we refer to as the main processing method. It's still kind of the, 
let's say the traditional names that were used so uh, you know like washed coffees so i think people are pretty familiar with with what that means and you have honey and then you have naturals that is let's say the the main categories but then when it comes to fermentation it's a lot of confusion and we're also confused so what we um, you know like uh, the way we're trying to use it and in, in a consistent way and um, also the way we try to communicate this is so we're combining what we call like the main processing method with the fermentation style and if you look at these things from the top where we're starting with traditional fermentation for washed and naturals um, you know I think that's what people are you know like uh, most familiar with it's that's aerobic, meaning it's like with the, with the oxygen that are naturally there. Uh, uh, you know, and that's typically parchment after washing that are fermented in a tank or in a bucket or even in bags, or if it's naturals, you know, like fermented on a drying table, as an example. Um, uh, so, you know, like that's classic. But then uh, when it comes to these other things, when we're talking about like extended fermentation, that can typically be, you know, like, let's say a traditional way of fermenting coffee in a tank, uh, but you extend the time of fermentation to start to manipulate flavors or to add more flavors to the coffees, right? Um, and then uh, we're using skin contact. That's kind of something uh, Kingsley uh, is doing with us as well. But, you know, like that's where, let's say you, that's mainly for washed coffees. When you're removing the fruit and skin by a pulper, you add that to the, uh, parchment when you're fermenting um, and then we're getting into the anaerobic uh, what we also call semi-anaerobic uh, kind of fermentation which I think is more of the topic on in this um, kind of webinar so that's when you're uh, fermenting it can be cherries or parchment but without uh, or with very little oxygen uh, when I'm saying uh, anaerobic or semi-anaerobic it's like you know sometimes the equipment is not you know like uh, let's say high tech enough to make it like completely without uh, oxygen but it's uh, it's easy to reduce it you can do that in in simple bags and stuff um so so when you see anaerobic or semi-anaerobic with us it's like without uh, fermented without oxygen and then you have uh, something we are saying here saccharic and lactic that could also be other stuff but we're using the names if we're adding yeast or bacteria to the to the coffee during fermentation, we're using the name of the yeast or bacteria uh, in combination with the processing method. And then you have carbonic maceration. I mean, we have chosen not to use that uh, in our general way of, of speaking about this, but it is basically so carbonic maceration in coffee, at least it's when you're when you're fermenting whole cherries in a closed environment, in an anaerobic kind of environment, it's coming from wine, used to be for grapes. Uh, and in the wine industry, they're also adding uh, carbon dioxide when they're fermenting whole grapes. Uh, but anyway, we're not using this for now, but maybe later. Um, next slide, uh, thank you. Um, so um, this is just an example from our list where you see uh, how we're combining these names. So you have on the top, for instance, extended fermentation, uh, natural, further down you have uh, anaerobic natural. If you go to Uganda, you see the skin contact wash that we're doing with Kinga. Um, and then, you know, like the next one is a semi-anaerobic natural. So this is how it will look on our list to clarify what we're doing on the different uh, processing methods. Okay, that's it. Awesome. Um, Morton, was this a part of your slide right here? This one? I think we'll go. It was something that we added, sorry. So uh, I forgot that. So yeah, that's, uh, that's a video from, uh, I just wanted to show you. It's from Indonesia when we're fermenting uh, whole cherries in buckets um, and uh, yeah you will just see how uh, you know like how it's developed with pressure inside so it was it's just like a super short one so you can continue to yeah talk. yeah yep. let me go back to it there
Well, now it's not going to play for us. There we go. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Thank you so much, Morton. All right, great. Well, thank you for explaining that. Um, I would love to bring in Andre and Italia now from Jaguata Coffee. So guys, um, I would love for you to tell us a little bit about the fermentation processes that you're cur currently managing. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the science behind fermentation, um, what's altering the flavor of the coffee and um, the styles of fermentation that you guys are particularly in engaging in. Hello guys, we are from Jaguara Coffee. I am Natalia Brito. Um, I am a, a coffee cupper, a founder of Jaguar Coffee, and also a coffee trader. And my name is André. Uh, I am a coffee researcher, founder of Jaguar Farmer, and an economist. We are producers and green coffee exporters. We are fascinated about uh, fermentation and everything that involves the agriculture and also coffee. The next is. We can go to the next. The next. Okay, thank you. Sorry about my English. I try my best here, and Natalia will help us here. And uh, we started five years ago the trials with the fermentation process. With some and uh, Nordic. Need Borodai help us to understand better, teach us about the fermentation process too, to understand better. We understand about the fermentation, the quality of coffee intensify with the fermentation process. And it's necessary to start the process with a very good coffee, our better coffee we start. Then was necessary to understand better inside the farm, each block and each cultivars was a better, is a better for started the fermentation. The next, please. This is a picture of different cultivars that we make like select picture tests. The, thank you. The first, we studied about the lot of have the more potentials. And the second time, uh, it's very difficult to test it, this model and to try to do in scale. In my opinion, this is a uh, hard, it's very hard, it's difficult to make like a test with a small volume and to be have the same result with the big volume. The next, please, the next. the next. This is a picture of the trials five years ago when you use the plastic box, for example. We tested different times of fermentations with water, without water, uh, open, close, uh, with uh, solar radiation, without solar radiation, different times, temperature, and after the fermentation process. It's very important to understand better about the best of the fermentation process. When we fermentation process, we start the dry process the next slide, please. This picture was uh, is a, a extended uh, system of fermentation. We make uh, trials with cultivars, different bricks, 
different states of maturation to make a fermentation. Uh, we did this year, and the result is very nice. The next. This is uh, the dry box that Andre was commenting about the extended fermentation. Um, we have some air, so we call extended fermentation. As Morty was explaining, it's still hard for us to define the right name for the fermentation. This is the drying box we have been using, so we can do it a bit on a scale. We just can, the next one, please, Dave. This is an example how the coffee looks like. Andre can explain, like as an agronomist, and also when people come to Brazil and look at the fungus, they think it could be like a, not good for the coffee, but actually it really improved our coffee comparing with normal dry and drying on the on the dry box that we provoke a small fermentation. Um, if you look at the next slide you're gonna see like how it looks. It looks really different from the normal drying. And the, the, the dry box, we have some air, but it, it really, we could do a bit on a scale. The other process we are doing is the anaerobic fermentation. You can see some pictures. We are doing barrel and also in, PP, in polypropylene bags. On the next slide, we are gonna explain usually we do in 24, we, we do some tests with 24 to 72 hours. The most like uh, important thing that we saw that changed our result is to do selective picking and also do the selection of the, the ripe cherries we are, we are doing. So this is why it's very hard to do it on scale because we, do, we need to do at the right time and we also have a big challenge because of the weather. So in the next slide, um, you see we are doing at Santa Lucia, that is part of our family. And uh, we are, we're doing berries. The berries is very heavy, so it's, very, it's hard to manage like the weight. But we saw very good results. And uh, the next slide. How, so how do you usually do? We do for, like we ferment for 72 to, to 72, 24 to 72 hours. Um, we have like during uh, our harvest, it's cold in Brazil, but sometimes we have like high temperatures. So we usually like the best results we had, it's con trying to control, which is hard because it's everything open, but we spray some water to try to control it. And the benefits, we see that the, the anaerobic fermentation really intensify the profile of the coffee. So if we have good coffee we have a very intense coffee and our challenge is to scale it up because it's very very hard to make like selective picking at the right time and because of the process this is how our coffee looks actually in the beginning like uh, when we started to do the fermentation together with uh, Dimitri I thought it was really like uh, so bad it was so bad but for me now I know how it tastes for me it looks like sugar it really intensify the coffee Thanks. so what do we measure during our fermentation we try to control the temperature the pH and the bricks the pH is something that is we saw that was very important during our process and the bricks Andre can comment the next slide please the bricks, yeah, usually we make the picking between 7 at uh, 25, and it's very important not so uh, bricks, it's very important to the, the uh, percent of maturation inside the block and the healthy of the fruit. It's very important we take a fruit with very good healthy. It's healthy? Yeah. Yes health of fruits to start the process uh, and the results is better comparing with, uh, for example, uh, bricks. Uh, with the bricks. Yes. <laughs> Not only the bricks, Andre, I so want sorry. to say, also <laughs> the, the, if the, the beans are healthy. 
So it's not so imp not only important like the sugar of the coffee, but also the yes. the size of the beans and how the beans they are. The next one, please. Uh, other challenge that we have, like to in, to to scale it up, is the drying. All the fermentation usually they are taking about 30 to 45 days. So this is an example when we are drying at the African bed. Um, it took like 25 days. So during the harvest, we have like a cold weather here in Brazil. So it's a big challenge. Sometimes we're testing new process. When the process was like a great, Morton would say, go ahead and do more. And we were like, we don't have enough chairs and we don't have enough time anymore to do it. So we need to go for the next year. And sometimes maybe the next year, it, we won't have the same temperature and the same thing. But uh, the results we had so far, uh, we have consistency, but sometimes it changes a bit of the flavor. The next. This is for the, this is how our coffee, they usually look, but we are gonna talk about that on the next subject, I think. Thank you guys. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Natalia and Andre. Cool. Well, next, I'd like to bring in you, Kingsley. Kingsley, um, you're working with some different uh, styles of fermentation as well. Maybe you can get into uh, the processes that you are currently managing um, there in Uganda. Yeah, sure. First of all, thanks for having me, and it's great to be it's great to be part of this. Um, there's my coffee estates. So that's in the southwest corner of Uganda. It's on the edge of Rwanda and Congo, and in the background, those hills, that's, that's the Congo. So we're about a two miles away from, from the border. Um, so right tucked in the southwest part of the country. Um, so I'm gonna talk about our process of, it's anaerobic sac fermentation. It is semi-anaerobic and um, we do it, the particular one I'm going to speak to today is a two-day process. So I'll take you through the process slowly and then I'll speak a bit about the science of it afterwards. So initially, the coffee comes to our estate as cherry. It's generally quite well picked, but occasionally we have to do some sorting. So what we would first do is, the first picture in the slide is one of our staff who is grading the coffee, grade one, grade two, grade three, depending on the, the quality. And after grading it, we then float the coffee to remove any defects. So what we're trying to do in the initial stage is to eliminate the poor qualities and only you know, have the top quality go through for the full processing. So we do a two-day sack fermentation. So the second picture is the coffee cherries being, they're actually taking a little bit out of the sack in that picture because we try and keep it the same amount of kilograms in each bag. So every bag is about 80 kgs before we tie them shut. So the last, the third picture there is the two hands there tying the bag shut. And the fourth picture is the coffee sitting in the, the central washing station after it's been bagged. So what we do is when the coffee comes in, it's put in the sacks for 48 hours. And in that 48 hours, it begins to ferment in the coffee cherry. And what this allows it to do is to bring in a lot of the, the sugary, fruity, kind of funky flavors you get with a natural. So you're adding as much of that kind of fruit as you can, the initial kind of sugary flavors to the cup before you do anything else. And we're very careful with the timing. We allow it to sit for 48 hours and not any longer. So that's the first step. Once the coffee has come out of the bags after 48 hours, we would then pulp it into our fermentation tanks, which I think is the next slide. Sorry, sorry, this, this slide before the next slide. This one is how the coffee looks after it comes out of the bags. Um, that white stuff, it, you know, it looks quite, you know, quite gnarly actually, but a lot of what's going on there is the flavors going back into the coffee, it's starting to heat up, it's starting to rot, it's starting to ferment. So what may look, you know, not very pleasing actually produces some beautiful flavors. So if you go to the next slide, that's the coffee after it has come out of the sack. It's then been put through our Pentagos Eco Pulper and put into a large fermentation tank. And you can see in that picture in the fermentation tank, you have the the coffee cherry, so the coffee skin, as well as the coffee bean. 
So we call it, it's sort of the skin, skin fermentation process where the coffee will sit until the pH reaches about 4.0. So it's 48 hours in the sack. It's then put through the eco-pulper to remove the majority of the pulp, about half of it, I'd say, and then it goes back into those, those tanks and is fermented until it reaches a pH of 4.0, um, at which point we remove it from the tanks. It's not further washed. It's not put through a gravity. But it's just taken directly from, from the fermentation tanks to the drying beds, which I think is the next slide. So you can see this slide's got two pictures. One is a close up of the coffee on the fermentation tanks. And you can see in that parchment, there's quite a bit of the skin still on there. There's some black bits. Again, it looks a bit funky, looks a bit dirty. It's not that kind of crystal white parchment that you would expect with a, with a washed coffee. But because it's semi-washed, it's you know, sack fermented, you get that kind of brown sort of over ferment, not over, but extra fermentation process. And that's where those really nice flavors come from. So this is the semi-anaerobic, and you get those beautiful kind of stone fruits, really whiny, really boozy, really sugary flavors. And you only get that if you have the extra pulp in there, if you have these extra fermentation methods. So it's quite different from a straight wash, but it's also not a full natural. So you're kind of getting the best of both. And the reason we chose to do the, the fermentation and the washing after putting it in the sack is to give you a very clean cup. So if you can pulp it and get it to the pH of 4.0, then you know all the fermentation is at the same level. So what you're gonna end up with is consistently clean, clear, crisp cups with a lot of fruit flavors in them. So that's kind of the method, how we do it with the two day anaerobic sac fermentation. Um, and what's happening in there is there's different kinds of yeasts uh, breaking down the coffee. So the coffee, when it's in the sack, there's one type of yeast breaking down the, the sugars into two different acids. So that's where you're getting the initial fermentation process. And then when you take it from the sack into the fermentation tanks, it's actually an entirely, entirely different kind of yeast, breaking down different sugars, producing different acids again. So you're getting, that's where you get the clean, crisp kind of cup. So essentially you've got two different yeasts breaking the coffee down in two different ways to produce a really clean, fruity, funky cup of coffee. So that's kind of like the science behind it, I guess the biology behind it. And I'll speak a bit more about why we chose this type of fermentation. Um, one, because it's, again, the natural, so you get those really nice flavors. Um, and two, because of the space it saves. So if you just do full naturals, you need a lot more raised beds for drying. But if you're gonna do the natural fermentation for two days in the sack, you can get those flavors. Then you can pulp it and you can get 40% less space needed to dry. You can dry a whole lot more coffee on the raised beds at the same time, reducing the amount of space you need for the same process. So a lot of it was based on, as we experimented on what we wanted to do in terms of space saving, but also having some really nice flavors. So and that's one of the biggest reasons. Uh, the second reason is just to increase the fruit, the sugars, and the depth of flavors in the cup, while still maintaining that clean kind of crisp flavor to it. So those are kind of the reasons for it. And I'll speak lastly a bit about the, the challenges. Um, sort of what they were saying from Jaguar Coffee as well, from Natalia and Andre, weather plays a big part in it. Um, you can't control sun, rain, sun, rain. One day it's 30 degrees Celsius, the next day it's 15 degrees Celsius. So sometimes you're struggling to control the process in terms of the environment, which is a, quite a challenge. But if you can keep the 48 hours the same, keep the pH to the 4.0, the drying time is roughly 25 to 30 days. If you can standardize those processes, then you can kind of take a lot of the guesswork out of what happens with the, the temperature and the climate. So you do battle it a little bit, but you can kind of mitigate those issues through um, clear fermentation times, clear pH, and a standardized drying time as much as possible. So that's basically the two-day sac fermentation process from start to finish. Uh, I hope it's been you know, informative. It's a lot of fun for us to try and we get some really interesting results. Awesome. Thank you so much. We'll be asking you a few more questions a little bit later, but thank you for all that information. Um, awesome.
Well, uh, you know, before we go, go on here, I'm going to ask Morton a question in just a second here. But before we go on, I'm curious, you, you guys engage in these at, at the farm, you engage in these processes, of course, and this is for the the flavor profile that eventually, um, you know, we're all tasting. I, I like to go to you, Natalia. Natalia, you're an experienced cupper that that you've been tasting these new styles of fermentation for years. How do you personally find these coffees yourself? Do you enjoy these new fermented styles of coffees? Um, and what are the flavor profiles that you're finding consistently from this style of fermentation? Um, actually, as like uh, Kingsley mentioned, and I like um, we, it's very, um, it, it has very unique flavors. But what I see, like uh, comparing, I cup all the coffee from our farms and also from the other producers. The most important thing is to select well the coffee like a, for the boot fermentation and um, the flavors they intensify the flavor of the coffee it doesn't uh, change completely it intensifies so the coffee needs to be very good uh, personally like uh, it like uh, we have like fruity uh, all type of profile that usually we don't have so much on the naturals from brazil so it, it really changed the profile and it, 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 like it becomes like a beautiful coffee, more clear, in my opinion. So speaking a little bit more about that, Morton, I'll bring you in here. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the, uh, the flavor notes with each of these fermentation methods and, and the impact of the fermentation on the cup. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there is like, uh, you know, like it, it all will depend on the, you know, like the environment you're in, like Andre was talking about, like the varieties, you know, like all that stuff. But I mean, there are certain things where, let's say, targeting in terms of cup, pro cup profile when we're, let's say, initiating uh, to do this with like uh, producers. Um, so to, to, to change the, the, or to tweak the kind of uh, attributes and profile. So, you know, like it totally depends on the level of fermentation and stuff, of course, but I mean, as a general thing, I'm gonna show like three different examples uh, of what we're doing. So, you know, like when we're talking about extended fermentation, in this case, like a washed extended fermentation, I mean, the goal is not to have the process take over the whole kind of thing. So we want it still to taste, you know, like to be very much unique to the place it's grown and the terroir and stuff like that, but just have another element of, of flavors to them. So, you know, like the, the goal would uh, normally be to get them, you know, like slight, in a positive way, pulpy and fermenty, you know, like adding kind of uh, some more layers of, uh, of uh, fruit flavors. Very often they can come out as, you know, like with kind of super mature fruit uh, things, chunky, more chunky fruit. Uh, um, they develop a different complexity and sweetness to them. But the, the, the goal here is to have like, let's say, subtle notes of, of a process. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then, uh, next slide, uh, Tyler. Oh, sorry, yeah, so uh, go back. Sorry, I was looking. Uh, then you have like the, in this case, let's say as a natural kind of semi-anaerobic or anaerobic, you can see the picture there, it's like in, in plastic bags. Uh, you know, they're, they're pretty uh, uh, sealed and tight and uh, you know, let's say you do that uh, as a two day fermentation, then we're trying to get more of the, what we call like boozy flavors, you know, like can be towards uh, alcohol. They typically also develop more of this kind of almost artificial candy flavors, uh, um, can be like bubble gum. Uh, and then they start to develop that typical lactic uh, kind of thing as well. Um, so this would be, let's say in between where, you know, like it's more, it's more processed flavors that it's still supposed to be kind of uh, tasting like a, a, a natural, as most people know naturals, but uh, you know, like maybe with different kind of elements of, of, uh, of fruits and, and wild stuff. I mean, here we're trying to get it a little more extreme. And then next slide. And then uh, in this case, for instance, if you're doing typically an anaerobic uh, thing, three to four days, you know, like in, uh, in barrels, in a closed environment, also, you, you know, like if the temperature is high, it's going pretty quickly. And then you're really getting into uh, crazy stuff, I would say. Um, 
some like it and some doesn't like it uh, but the, the the what i find fascinating is that it develops flavors that is you know like completely different from what from what you kind of think of with coffee and uh, you know like but in this case when you're doing this stuff i mean then it's your it's a fine balance because you know like if the process totally takes over it'll taste similar across like all kind of origins because the the, the flavors are so strong from the process so of course again it's about to do it right with if you have like a good environment and a good potential in the first place with the right varieties and are are doing stuff correctly i mean this can be an amazing thing because uh, yeah we want this to be we want it to be extreme and then they typically have spicy flavors it could be herbal dill ginger cinnamon is something that people often find in this kind of coffee so so you know like that's just three examples but we're typically trying to achieve some of these kind of things across like different uh, origins but also trying to preserve the the natural kind of uh, uh, terroir they, they should have yeah thanks awesome great Thank you so much. Well, now that we've covered what's going on at the farm a little bit and the that flavor profile that you were mentioning, I'd like to bring in the the roasters here. First, I'd like to start with with you, Lex. Um, Lex, I know you've had some experiences with these coffees for some time now. Maybe you can talk a little bit about when you first encountered this style of coffee, how your uh, approach to roasting them has changed, and what do you aim for now when roasting these coffees, and what are you keeping in mind when preparing your roast approach? Hi, so uh, thanks uh, for inviting me, first of all. Um, so yeah, I think the first time I ever heard about these kind of coffees was um, when I watched uh, Sasha Sestich in uh, 2015 on the World Barista Championships. I think it's the first time I ever heard about carbonic maceration. Um, and I remember tasting his coffee um, and it was just like completely from a different world for me. Uh, the intensity of the flavor was just just insane. Um, so I really remember this, and uh, also tasting his milk drink, it was like a raspberry cheesecake. So it was, it was like a really new uh, kind of sensation for me. Um, and I think the first experimental coffee that I roasted myself was um, the Semina Bay in 2016 or maybe 17 when I was competing. Um, and I remember it was very expensive and it looked like shit. Uh, it looked like it was very brown, there were broken bits, there were small, big beans, and I almost sent it back. Um, but of course, we, 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 we roasted it, we tried it, and it tasted amazing. Um, so this was really an eye-opener, I think, uh, for me and for us at the roastery, uh, because it kind of like it was something very new, super interesting. Um, and I think from that point on, we've always had like uh, some... Uh, fermented coffees in our uh, in our roastery just to uh, to roast and, and try and sell. Uh, so super interesting. Of course, it really changed um, our approach as well because we had all these new flavors uh, coming up, and um, it kind of changed um, like our, our our perspective a lot. Um, and I think we always had like pros and cons looking at these uh, at these coffees. Um, the pros are easy because it tastes amazing. Um, uh, Amy uh, won the World Brewers Cup in 2018 with the Brazilian coffee against all the Panama geishas. Um, and this kind of showed, I think, that there was a lot more possible with, with, with coffee, uh, which is super interesting. So I think that's, that's a big pro. Um, I think it really changed the coffee landscape in a very good way. Um, and I see a lot of farmers doing these experimentations now, uh, which, is, which is really great because more people can taste uh, this and it's, it's like taste wise it's super interesting so i think that's a that's a really good thing uh the, the downside you could say is that um, it makes terroir and origin seem like a little bit less important in some way um because at some point you taste a lot of fermentation and and you kind of the the origin the terroir goes to the background a bit so this is kind of something we um we try to 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 take in mind. Um, so yeah, this this is kind of I think where we're we're battling with uh, at the, at the moment. Yeah. Great, thank you. So uh, I'd like to bring in Dima next, and I'll uh, stop sharing my screen there. There we go. Um, Dima, when we were pre preparing for this webinar, uh, you talked to me a little bit about a method that you use for evaluating green 
beans of fermented coffees. Can you talk a little bit about the process for evaluation that you use when you receive a fermented coffee? Um, and then after that, can you talk maybe a little bit about how this evaluation then informs your roasting plan for this uh, fermented coffee? Yeah, okay. Are you hearing me? Yes, sir. Good enough? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's start. Uh, I'm Dmitry Borodai. I uh, like in coffee 15 years and uh, we did experiments in uh, I think 10 different countries in total five, six containers. We're not interested in like to do experiments which is 15, 20 kg. We do it in a bags, like 50 bags, 20 bags. And uh, we little bit know about the, how to produce a stable result in a big volumes. So what I learned uh, for the last five years about the fermentation, you cannot control the fermentation if you not control the population, but you can control the environment where is bacteria working. Because uh, in a fact, the fermentation like a process is uh, an aerobic process. When we speak about the environment, we speak about uh, like we can say lactic, anaerobic, aerobic, acetic, that we spill up, uh, speak about the kind of uh, in, uh, environments and uh, the way where we try to like target uh, the bacteria uh, working. Yeah, but uh, what we are forgot a little bit. We speak about the fermentation like uh, uh, that we produce the taste uh, because the wine industry produces it like the same. But wine industry produces the taste in a juice and use the juice like a drink yes you cannot produce uh, the taste uh, in a fermentation like tank in a beans you produce it in a moustache that's a totally uh, like a, it's a big differences between the wine process and the coffee process so in a coffee process uh, the most important part is not produce the taste during the fermentation it's a transferring this taste from the moustache to the beans because you cannot produce anything into the beans. Beans no uh, have a sugar. It's kind of a seventy more percent cellulose base, and you produce the uh, taste in a moustache, uh, in a, like uh, where you have a sugar content more than twenty percent, and then you try to transfer it to the uh, kind of green beans. That's how the fermented taste uh, is uh, like uh, born. So, uh, and now I want to show you little differences between the beans uh, and how it's looking like fermented and not fermented beans. I will show you from the, my uh, phone uh, camera because I prepare some beans for you. You hear me or not? Yeah? Yep. Okay. So this one. That's uh, for you understanding three different beans. So one is uh, washed, uh, the second one is natural, and the third one is uh, kind of an aerobic fermentation. Firstly, let's read it because it's a one station only. It's uh, washed coffee from Ethiopia Uraga, natural coffee from Ethiopia Uraga, and uh, like five days on aerobic uh, from Ethiopia Uraga washing station. So let's see how it's looking. Uh, so that is uh, washed stuff, yeah? That's a natural stuff. And that is uh, anaerobic stuff. If you compare like two uh, type of beans, like washed and natural, you can see the differences that the uh, natural and anaerobic, you can see the differences that the anaerobic is uh, uh much more smaller why it happened because uh in this case we are transferring all the taste inside the beans so it's changed the color and they change the size uh because uh, when you are uh producing the taste during the fermentation what you do uh and why a natural fermentation coffee uh is a much more brighter usually than the washed or honey experiments because when you produce a taste uh, in a moustache inside the cherry you not affect the taste of the beans but when you go to drying patio the cherry is uh go smaller and smaller they change the uh, size and create uh, the skin Create the pressure inside the cherries. And in these moments, what you produce, like the taste in the fermentation, uh, go inside the beans. And the beans start to be smaller. But if you come back a uh, little bit, one step uh, 
that's a final result of the bin. But if you come back one step uh, before, you see these beans, I'm just uh, put the beans uh, into two hours in the hot water and the beans now is much more bigger. That's what you have uh, approximately, that's what you have in the start of uh, the fermentation. The beans is uh, bigger and uh, low dense and when the, the drying process is, is starting, the beans go smaller and smaller. So it's changed the uh, size. But the skin of the cherry creates a pressure and taste go inside. That's why the natural fermentation, uh, like long fermentation as cherry, uh, usually is much more brighter and look uh, not so good. It can be look like a full sour beans or something like that. So, uh, and when you produce uh, some experimental stuff with the honey process, you not uh, change the kind of uh, the size of the beans. You can, uh, if you use a, like fermented stuff from the Africa and for example, for Colombia, you can see that the differences of the size because uh, usually uh, over fermented uh, Ethiopian coffee is uh, actually much more smaller than, for example, Colombian or Costa Rican because uh, you overheated during the drying process and uh, the size uh, like uh, changes so fast. So, for example, uh, on this table, I have uh, three differences more uh, special prep from Costa Rica, which we do with uh, Marianella Montera. That's a normal honey process. You can see it's a normal honey process. That's a four days honey anaerobic fermentation. And this one is a barrel modulation. So, uh, that's what we do in Russia. We placed uh, uh, for two months beans uh, to the whiskey barrel after Russian imperial style beer, uh, and uh, it's changed totally. So, for example, you can see how it's looking uh, roasted stuff, yeah? That's a normal one, normal one, and that's one after barrel. So, it's a totally dark. So, but if you can see, it's not changed the uh, size of the beans because it's a honey process and it's not like uh, create the pressure in, inside the cherry and the uh, size of the beans is not changing. So what I am learned uh, from the experimental side, uh, if you have uh, some experimental beans, you need firstly look the green and see how it's changing. The second one, you need to taste the green. I'm not recommended uh, to your health and for your grinders, but I will show what I do in Russia. So the first, one when we receive the samples from the beans because we have uh, like, like uh, now 20 or 25 different experimental stuff uh, in our uh, web shop yeah so the first one you can see how look in the green beans yeah we ground it on a grinder and then brew it in the water uh, like a half hour in the water uh, no specific temperature, no specific protocol, just uh, pour the hot water. And the, if you can see from the washed coffee and from the natural coffee, the solution is quite the same, yeah? Because uh, there's nothing inside, it's just terroir taste. But if you see the five days anaerobic fermentation, that is, you see, the color is uh, totally yellow. So, why we do it? When we cup the coffee, if you have only terror taste uh, and uh, you can evaluate the cup and you will find only two tastes inside. It's a kind of raw uh, soya and uh, kind of garden pea and nothing else. So that will be terror coffee. That's not depends from which country this coffee. It can be from the Kenya, from Ethiopia. The taste will be the same if it's uh, classic washed coffee, but uh, when you cap the uh, fermented coffee, natural like uh, five, six days anaerobic stuff, you will find uh, the color will be different and taste will be different because uh, the mustache stuck on the silver skin and the silver skin stuck on the surface of the beans and you have a lot of sugar and the uh, product of the fermentation process uh, outside of the beans and inside of the beans. That's why, and uh, when you start to brew these beans, uh, the sugar will dilute it in the water and when you drink it, you will find like uh, it's kind of apple cider or uh, like fruity wine. The taste will be crazy. So uh, that's what we do to understand what the coffee we have now, right now. Uh, like it's fermented stuff or it's a normal green stuff. 
because uh, when you have the green coffee, you understand actually uh, that's a funky beast or not. The same example you can do with uh, fake coffee. As you know, some farmers uh, put cinnamon inside or something else. If you produce it in a green stuff and uh, not in a terroir, and you put something inside, you can ground the green coffee, you can cup it, and if you will find distant flavor, what you find in a roasting coffee, it's totally fake coffee. So for example, what we did with cinnamon, we cup the green coffee and we understand the farm, uh, farmer cheat, cheater, and <laughs> they put cinnamon inside because that was a totally cinnamon green stuff. So uh, when we speak about the natural, you need to understand uh, like uh, why is the natural and the uh, funky natural is totally different on the taste. For example, all the people know that the, like a classic natural coffee is uh, uh, sweet coffee, yeah? And the classic worst coffee is a kind of uh, with a nice uh, acidity coffee. Why natural coffee is sweet? Because it's not uh, kind of ferment stuff. So when you pick the cherry, the fermentation start, but uh, low speed. You put it into the patio or African bands, doesn't matter, and start to drink the coffee, uh, to dry the coffee. Water content go down so fast, like in the first day, and fermentation is uh, kindly stop. That's why the, you have uh, rest a lot of sugar, uh, on a massage, and this sugar just stuck on the surface of the beans. So, in fact, natural produced coffee is a coffee with a sugar. And then you roast it, and you see that the coffee is sweeter. But if you produce the ferment, fermented stuff uh, by the natural way, like eight days uh, uh, coffee, like eight days fermentation, you will see that the natural coffee uh, will be like a sour or uh, super acidic. Is not uh, like sweet anymore because the bacteria and the yeast of course break down the sugar content and produce uh, a lot of acids which is go inside the beans that's why the, like a uh, natural fermented stuff is much more sour than the normal worst coffee because you produce a lot of acids and then you transfer it uh, inside the beans that's a totally different ways uh, not like a uh, natural uh, Coffee because the natural coffee, in my opinion, is kind of rising coffee. The coffee with the sugar content uh, on the surface of the beans, uh, it's kind of aromatic stuff, you know. Uh, but uh, it's, I mean, like, uh, it's a totally different uh, philosophy, natural and uh, like natural uh, fermented coffee because it's a totally different way. So that's a first evaluation how we are evaluate the coffee, as you understand. So we just drink this one. I, I will not do it in uh, okay <laughs> because it's uh, like I mean just uh, by the spoon yeah and uh, you will find the taste uh, like uh, kind of uh, whiny or not and uh, that's uh, how how we do it in Russia yeah but I'm not recommended uh, because it's uh, not so uh, safe to your health so and uh, when you are uh, speak about uh, like a uh, normal worst experiment. Uh, kind of uh, usually the coffee is not so uh, bright uh, because uh, like skin is not create the pressure and the taste not go inside fully that's why it's a uh -oh. natural experimental stuff yeah so yeah thank you so much for explaining that so now moving on from from that being able to evaluate the green coffee in the way you described maybe you can show us uh, an example of a roasting profile of uh, one of those coffees yeah uh, I can explain how we do it, okay? Uh, so yeah. that's only two way. Uh, when you have uh, fermented beans, you have a two uh, taste base inside of the beans. The first one is a terroir uh, base, yeah? It's a create on a tree, like during nine months. And uh, another base is a fermented base. If you transfer in it properly inside the beans, it will be a lot of uh, fermented taste inside of the beans. And you need to roast it properly. The first one is a sugar content and silver skin outside of the beans. And the second one is a terror base. So only one of the differences uh, between the normal washed coffee and the experimental coffee, we not overheat the sugars. Because the sugar on the surface of the beans. And as you can see, that's why I'm preparing you this set. This is honey. You have a lot of sugar content outside of the beans. But the barrel modulation give more sugar. That is totally like look like uh, roasted coffee, yeah. And for example, we roast this coffee for filter. Look like that is a filter. So that's a really amazing stuff. It tastes really good, but look like uh, robusta from Vietnam, yeah. 
because it's a lot of sugar uh, outside of the beans and the normal beans uh, from uh, this project is uh, look like a normal filter coffee when you are overheat the beans is the sometimes uh, you can have uh, oil surface or a really dark surface uh, that's uh, why you need to learn how it's draws because sometimes if you have an oily surface some roasters can say or some customers can say it's over roasted coffee but firstly please don't judge this coffee before you not cup it because sometimes in a, uh, over fermented coffee is uh, have a really a lot of sugar and acids and the coffee uh, for example which we won in a brewer's cup in Russia uh, we roast with uh, 5 seconds of development time and uh, another lot 12 seconds. After 20 seconds of development time, the coffee was like a uh, kind of oil, you know, uh, the surface. Because it's a lot of content inside and you need to preserve it uh, during the roast. But sometimes, uh, like over fermented coffee can be oily on a surface and the normal in a taste. That's why the roaster cannot roast uh, properly this coffee because it's uh, really tricky stuff. They try to roast it and uh, try to make it like a normal looking, like, okay, that's look good. Yes, good. But you not uh, develop the terroir taste because you just develop uh, sugar on the surface, not burn it. And the terroir is underdeveloped. That's why usually fermented stuff is uh, one, like uh, the same taste uh, what like uh, you have in a batches. So, I mean, you need to start to develop the uh, taste of terroir and taste of sugar. So if you can, uh, can you show uh, my uh, screen from laptop? I will show the, just the differences between five days. Uh, yeah, you'll have yeah. to click the share screen button on your end. Um, yeah, I, I did it. Okay, perfect. Yep, we can see it. We, we can see that. Okay. Yep. So this one is uh, beans, uh, like what we roast uh, from the washed coffee. So it's a normal hour profile. What we do, we just uh, roast with a normal uh, curve. Before the crack, we do a little bit more energy. And then after crack, you see, after crack, when we have intensive crack, after 30 seconds, we just uh, switch off the burner. So in this case, with the washed coffee, we switch off it like for, from 75 to 30%. And uh, on the end stage, we put it on a zero because uh, we call it after pyrolysis. Uh, when the coffee is uh, roast yourself, like uh, themselves, uh, it's accumulate a lot of energy during the uh, first uh, two phase. And then it's enough to develop in the roaster. So that is a profile for the normal washed Ethiopian, what you saw on a table. This one is uh, really similar, uh, like uh, really common to our, our roastery. What we change in uh, uh, experimental stuff from this uh, farm, it's not big differences. So we put just 7% less energy and it can be the same energy, for example. But after crack, the uh, beans accumulate a lot of energy because you have a lot of sugar outside of the beans and you don't need to burn it. So what you need to do after intensive crack, after 30 seconds when it starts, we just drop the uh, burn uh, to zero. You see, it's just a zero, no more. So, because it's a lot of sugar uh, outside of the surface of the beans and you need to stop uh, the pyrolysis uh, in time. So that's how we roast experimental stuff, yeah? And if you see the comparison of these two profiles, you will see that is uh, not so big differences. It's a big difference because uh, it's, uh, in the end, the the flame, like the burn, is a different adjustment. Why? Because you have a lot of sugar, and with sugar you can bake it. It's no problem. But if you overheat it uh, from uh, uh, carbon hydrate, you will have uh, just uh, carbon. You know, you just uh, like water go out, and you will have a carbon on the surface. So that's why the taste will change so fast after uh, correctly start. So my advice, not overheat the sugar, but you need to develop the uh, terror base. That's why we operate uh, the biggest differences, only uh, the last stage of the roasting. So on a development time. Are you understand? 
Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. it's a, not a <laughs> big difference. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, I, I really love this. So if you um, have a question, you can ask me and uh, I, I say the, what we do usually because it's not so big. Uh, it's not so big uh, differences between, uh, I mean, uh, between uh, roasting like a washed natural or uh, experimental stuff in my opinion. Because uh, the roasters have a mistake because they uh, get I mean, on the roster, you know, they put a lot of comments inside the crops. They put like 100 comments, and uh, sometimes I see how they roast, and I not understand. Are you roast or are you writing uh, the message to your girlfriend? Because uh, it's a lot of messages, and uh, my brain is just not working so fast, and I not understand how he can keep the roasting profile uh, during the right this 100 comment. So we do only one comment. It's a caller. After roasting, of course, <laughs> because uh, it's uh, so, uh, for me, I not understand it, how they put a lot of comments and understand uh, how the roasting process is going on, you know. So you need to understand that the, the beans uh, roasting uh, like uh, themselves after the crack, you cannot change anything if you not open all the, you know, tubes and uh, put a lot of air inside. So you're working on a crack uh, the first seven, eight minutes before the crack and uh, we accumulate an energy inside the beans and then we decide when we uh, cut off the energy. That's only one way how we change the profile. But in, in the time we can have like 20, 25 uh, different copies, which is like 15 is experimental stuff and 10 is a normal plastic uh, prep. So, so let's I mean, try. Like, uh, that's working, just believe me. Let's get, let's get, thank you so much for explaining that. Um, I would love to, to get Lex's perspective on this as well. Lex, I know um, that of course you're roasting um, fermented coffees as well and, and you have some profiles to show us um, as you have uh, prepared. If you wanna share your screen with us, you can also talk about the, your process with uh, roasting these fermented coffees compared to ones that aren't. Can you guys hear me? Yep. All right, good. Yeah, so yeah, we have we have some um, experiment with the roasting these coffees. Uh, I think it started with competition. We roasted for competition and for ourselves as well. So this is kind of how we got into this and uh, roasting these styles of coffees. Um, my first time, like I said, was uh, in 2016 when I um, roasted two coffees for competition. I'm gonna try to share my screen. Uh, like this, can you see this? Yep. All right, so so I use these two coffees. Top is um, uh, Semina Bay from Ethiopia, uh, fermented coffee, and the bottom one was Geisha from uh, Colombia. So as you can see, this is very very different, um, obviously. Um, and and so um, I was gonna I was gonna show uh, the 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 kind of judges to. Uh, to show the two different worlds in coffee. So you have these perfect beans on the bottom and you have these really ridiculous looking coffees uh, at, the, at the top. Um, of course, it's very different. And, and I thought, uh, you know, this, this, this is going to be uh, roast wise, it's going to be very different as well. This is a few years back. Um, so I, I decided to look up the, uh, the profile of these two coffees because I thought it would be interesting to see uh, what I did back then. Um, I'm just gonna try and share my screen again. I don't know how. Oh yeah, yeah. So I looked at both profiles and uh, this is what I found. They were almost identical. <laughs> um, so it could mean that I had no idea what I was doing back then, could be true. Um, I'm not so sure. Uh, I think um, if you look at fermented coffees versus classic washed coffees, um, I think we, we approach them the same. Like Dimitri said, um, I don't think you have to roast them differently per se, just because they're fermented. Um, we, we always just do the same thing what we do with all of our coffees. We roast um, and then we taste it and then we ask ourselves, do we like this or not? Um, and if we don't like it, we'll, we'll try to change it. If we do like it, we, 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 we keep it like that. So this is, this is not really different for for fermented coffees, in my opinion. Um, 
The only thing, if, if there would be something different, is that, that we probably uh, try to roast the fermented coffees mostly as short as possible and as light as possible without underdeveloping. I think you don't need to caramelize a lot because there's already quite a lot of sugars inside and around the beans. Uh, but this would be kind of the only thing for me at the moment that I would, uh, would kind of change. Um, for the rest, it's pretty similar uh, uh, as what we do to, to, to washed coffees or, or, uh, or different coffees. Um, I think a bigger challenge for us at the moment is um, what we do with these coffees. How do, we, how do we score the green coffees and the roasted coffees and how do we explain the flavors to customers? I think this is for us at the moment a bigger challenge. Um, it's a bit like when, we started, when I started tasting my first funky naturals from Ethiopia like 10 years ago. Um, I, I tasted them when I was working at the coffee company in, in Amsterdam as a small chain and the, the founder learned me how to cup and he, he, uh, we, I, I still remember the first time I, I tasted like a natural Ethiopia. There was a couple of them on the table and, and this owner was an old school guy and he, he didn't like naturals, it was, he didn't like it. So he was mumbling with every coffee, he's like, ah, defect, defect, defect. And I was tasting him as well and I thought, fuck, this is amazing, you know. What is he talking about? So um, this is kind of, I think the same thing is almost happening at the moment. There's a lot of people that like have no idea what, what they're tasting, you know? This is new and it tastes funny, different, funky. Um, and, and I think this is kind of what we have to explain as a roastery um, or as baristas even to kind of prepare them what, they're, what they can expect. Um, and same goes for like scoring roasted coffee and also scoring green coffee. It's, it's very different. Um, so we have to kind of keep an open mind and, um, and, and just uh, look at it like that, I think. Um, so to kind of sum up, <laughs> uh, yeah, fermented coffees can behave, behave different, but I think it's important to keep an open mind and just taste what you're doing and, and just base all your decisions on that. Because in the end, that's the only thing, I think. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah. So you, you mentioned and, and, and Dima mentioned to this, this kind of shocking visual green coffee, which really doesn't look all that uh, appealing when you're, if you're, especially if you're not used to it. Um, Natalia, I would love to ask you <clears throat> a, a question about that. So these types of coffees can look quite different from what uh, exporters are used to or quality ins inspectors might uh, be used to as well. Have you encountered any issues with the visual aspect of these green coffees in, uh, in your experience? Actually, those coffees look really like crazy. Uh, like in the beginning, even for us, when we were trying for the first time, I was really, I really thought we ruined the coffee because it looks totally different. But um, it's still a challenge because if, like specialty coffee, something still new for Brazil is like fermentation even more. So it's a big challenge. I have an example uh, uh, of coffee. Uh, this is the normal process. And this is the fermentation ones. I know Dimitri has shown some, some, but it really looks like totally different. But uh, what I say, it's like uh, ugly out outside, but beautiful inside. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, I, uh, Kingsley, I want to bring you into this conversation too. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about, you had mentioned earlier, you talked a little bit about the advantages uh, of, of roasting with uh, new fermentation methods like this. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the risks of working with these styles of coffees and, and how we can potentially mitigate these, uh, the risks of uh, producing these types of coffees as well. Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Um, yeah, I think some of the risks it depends on, on the size of, of the farmer and the size of the farm. But one of the biggest risks would be if you're asking a, a producer who's on a very limited budget to experiment on, say, a, a four or five, six day fermentation method that's then going to be washed and dried in a certain way. You're asking a lot of, of, of her farm or his farm. And, and if, if they do this sort of thing and it, results aren't good, they may be stuck with coffee that they either can't sell at you know, the usual price or can't sell at all, becomes commercial grade. So one of the largest risks I find, even for larger producers, is you don't want to do 
a huge lot of something that you're unsure of. So it's, it takes from, you know, from the day the coffee is picked on the tree to when you can cup it, minimum 30 days for some of these processes. So it, that's, if your cough season is three months long, that's a third of the season already gone in one trial. So the, one of the biggest risks is again, if someone does this, if I'm going to do this or, or Jaguar coffee or anybody else, that's 30 days of our season that's it's already kind of gone. And if it turns sour, you're sort of stuck with what you have. So it's, if you can get a producer, sorry, if you can get to, you know, a green bean importer or a roaster to kind of pre-commit and pre-finance and say, if you do five bags as a trial and it turns out terribly, we'll take on the financial, you know, fallout. Or we'll take a 50-50, something where, you, where the producer is confident in that no matter what happens, they're not going to be stuck holding the bag, you know, literally and, and figuratively. So I think that's one of the bigger ones um, would, would be the economics behind it all. Um, but also with that comes the, you know, the advantages of if you do these kind of fermentation techniques and you produce something that is not only unique to your, to your area, but perhaps to your estate or your farm, then you've got a product that is great because it, it's very unique and, and really high end, but also it's difficult to market two or three bags of a super extreme micro lot. So you're sort of, the, the positives are you get some fantastic coffees and the one person who gets those three bags of coffee is probably very happy. You know, she's probably super impressed. She loves the coffee, roasting it, tasting it. You know, his customers love it, but that's all you have. So you can't really upscale that. So then another risk would be you're producing something that's incredible, but you're producing it on a very small scale and you, you really can't market that to the larger audience. So you have to go in with the confidence knowing, okay, I'm going to do this. I'll do four bags the first year. For the first season, I'll do 50 bags the next season. So if the finances are there, then it, it's, it's much easier to move forward. And Morton, I'll bring you in here um, as a coming, you know, Kingsley being the, the producer there and, and he's passing coffees over to you as the importer. What, what is Nordic Approach doing to help mitigate the risk for uh, the producer when they're engaging in these types of processes? Uh, I would say, you know, like, first of all, we would, um, you know, like, depending on where you're uh, at in the world and in what origin, I mean, you have to understand the, the, the local infrastructure, you know, like it can be like really remote places. It can be in countries where, you know, like access to equipment and, uh, and, you know, like, uh, uh, even, even simple things like proper uh, tanks or buckets or whatever can be uh, difficult to 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 buy so you know like first of all you have to look at all the circumstances and the local infrastructure and also see the potential of where you're at um, and then secondly the producer you know like we have to be selective on the producer like uh, like Kingsley say we don't want to put you know like put uh, a, a small producer in a place where you know like he's uh, it's taking up all his time and all his capacity and then it turns out you know like not to be successful so of course we we have to be selective on the producer and we also want to do this you know like over time so it depends on the mindset of the producer that he's like really interested in in engaging in this and and um, and stuff like that but then and then of course you will take the the risk kind of reward um, kind of discussion also just like uh, just just so it's clear you know like if we're doing this or if the producer is is keen on doing this there are some risk involved uh, um, so so I think that's the the most important thing to map out before you start anything um, but then when we do have something going and uh, you know like we we uh, we are uh, you know like in um, in the uh, in a place where we can start uh, processing or or planning this then we would very often pre-contract this kind of coffees and show like 100% commitment. Uh, as long as, you know, like the producer is also doing what we agreed upon, of course. Uh, and then, uh, and besides of pre-contracting that kind of coffees, we are also often doing pre-finance because sometimes this can be more expensive to produce or that's also again to show commitment also that, you know, like we will buy it in the end, uh, even if it's not like exactly as we expected. Um, and then the other things we're, we're trying to do, like Kingsley also said, you know, like we're not really interested in doing this, you know, like for three bags and up the price to $100 per pound. That's not the goal. It's to do this kind of when we find something that works, we want to do it on scale. Um, 
at a, let's say a reasonable price. I mean, the producers definitely is going to get paid for all the extra work and the cost and the effort and the risk he's taking. But, you know, like we still want it to be at the price level where the roasters can actually, you know, like have, you know, like it's supposed to be a business also for the roasters, not just like a few bags for a marketing purpose. And then that's it. And then finally, when it works, you know, like even the first year you have to think, let's say, okay, if this works, is it possible to scale up? you know like uh with the with the setup the producer have them and stuff like that so that's how we're kind of thinking about it so yeah but definitely it should be you know like uh, it should benefit the producers it's not just a cool thing that we want to do to market ourselves for um yeah so it should be like a win-win thing Great, thank you. So we're gonna to get to the Q&A in just a second. Before we do, I wanna ask everybody that joined us one more question, and this should just be 20 second answer, real quick um, response, two to three sentence response here. But, um, and I'll start with you first, Natalia, but what do you think is the future for these styles of fermentation? Natalia, I'll start with you first. Actually, my answer would be, that's the future. It, it, it brings us so much knowledge and uh, that's like the really new on the coffee. And it will stay, in my opinion. Kingsley, what do you think? <laughs> Sorry, Natalia, you want to say one more thing? No, thank you. Thank you so much. Kingsley, what do you think? Yeah, I think the future is, is here. These coffees are here to stay. When you get the process right, it's fantastic. Producers like myself, like Natalia, even the small ones I work with, they can do it. Um, so if we're all committed to this, this is where it's going to be, and I think it's going to keep getting better. Lex, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think, uh, also think so. I think um, this is going to be like the new standard, so like the naturals of, of 10 years ago. And um, I, I, I hope, if we're lucky, that, that because this is going to be the new standard, we're going to have, have a little bit more focus on terroir and origin again after we're all used to this, uh, these styles of coffee, I think. Thank you. And then Dima, what do you think the future is for these styles of fermentation, Dima? So I think the future for fermentation is, uh, as I said before, uh, natural is uh, sweet, but natural fermented coffee is a sour. I think for espresso, the people will uh, choose uh, like a short, uh, a hot, anaerobic, and maybe with yeast fermentation, which is uh, 24 till 48 hours, no more. And then uh, they will have a bright and uh, sweet stuff. But uh, for the filter, uh, you can experiment till eight, 10 days. It depends about your environment and about the temperature. So I think it will be divided by the fermentation for the espresso and fermentation for the filter coffee because the uh, filter have a low TDS and low concentration and the espresso have a high TDS. We need more body sweetness and sugar inside the beans. And uh, that's why it's, we'll divide on uh, two divisions like espresso fermentation and the filter fermentation. I think it will be like that. Mm. Thank you. Cool, we'll get into the Q&A now. Um, one of the main questions that was asked was, will this be webinar available later to watch? Yes, it will be. This will be on YouTube later so that you can rewatch it many, many times. Um, cool, so one of the first questions that we'll go to here is from Felipe Mesquita de Miranda asked, um, and this is for the roasters. I would like to know your experience storing green beans of fermented lots. In some cases, we see that the quality decreases more quickly than usual. Uh, Lex or Dima, do you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, we, we, we haven't found this so far. I, I think, uh, if anything, uh, the, um, the, the, the coffees with extended fermentation seem to help up a bit longer, maybe because of the sugars uh, inside the bean. We, we don't see a decrease in quality more quickly, no. Okay. So we don't, we don't have any uh, specific storage, uh, like different than, than, uh, than more traditional copies okay. now. Gotcha. So uh, I think, are you hearing me? Yeah. Yep. So I think the different fermentation, if you have a lot of sugar outside uh, the surface is uh, I think uh, the life for this coffee is not uh, one year, it can be two years because now we have an experiment which is a uh, past crop and uh, it's still amazing because it's a lot of sugar and sugar preserve. And uh, one more thing that the sugar can uh, absorb the water. 
so uh, it's not uh, so risky to have a high uh, have a high humidity on a, your like storage place or something like that but uh, it's better mm. to have uh, the same condition what you have for the, your worst and natural stuff but in fact uh, the fermented fermented stuff uh, have a really long life so twice more i think so than the normal terror coffee mm. This next one, uh, Morton, you could probably respond to this one. Um, we have a question from Miriam asking, has anyone compared the level of humidity in the unfermented versus fermented greens? Uh, I mean, I'm not sure if I understand the, the question exactly, but uh, let's say for us, I mean, we, we are still, because we, we need to, to gather more data and knowledge, so at this point, we're still working within the same humidity and water activity limits as we are doing for washed uh, traditional coffees. So we don't gotcha. really we don't really differentiate that mm -hmm. right now. But uh, yeah, I mean, even if we've done this kind of uh, preps for a while, I mean, we still we, we still have a lot more data on let's say normal processed coffee than we have on the special prep. So it'll be interesting to to look into that uh, you know going forward. So this next question is for the producers on the topic of duration of fermentation. Um, so we have the question, how do you decide on the duration of fermentation uh, and what happens if you leave it for more than 48 hours? Um, one of the producers want to answer that one. Mm, we, can, we can answer. Actually, um, we decide before like to do like uh, for how many hours. And uh, if it passes, it can be like we can have a bad fermentation actually. So we try to work in a secure time because we also want to be safe on the results. Because if it tastes bad, we might not have anyone to take it. So it's a big risk. So we do like uh, actually we do pre order and uh, like who we work, like Nordic and Dimitri, they they are already ordered in advance and they share with us the risk. But uh, so we needed to try, of course, they are committed, but we want to give, like to deliver to them the best results. So we try to work in some like limited hours to not have like a very different or bad result. Thank you. Um, so this next question here also for the producers, a couple uh, questions about pH. Maybe we can kind of combine these. Um, what should be the ideal temperature and pH when fermenting coffee? Are you uh, measuring pH directly in the cherries or the coffee cherries in water? That's interesting. Um, Kingsley, any, you want to answer? Yeah. Either of those? Yeah. Um, the ideal temperature is a bit difficult. To, to say just because of the, the variations in climate. So if we're to try and set an ideal temperature around 25 to 30 degrees Celsius, you know, you'd have to be very, very controlled either in an air conditioned facility or when it's cold in a heated facility. So it's hard to say this temperature is the right one every time because the temperature fluctuates greatly. The, it can get up to 70 degrees when it's fermenting in the sack. It gets quite hot as it starts to break down. So the, the variation will go from, from quite high in the sack to when you put it in the water, the water we use is, is from the spring from the ground. So it's around you know, 10, eight degrees Celsius. So you're taking the temperature from quite high to quite low when you ferment it in the tanks. So there isn't any kind of one consistent temperature point we have um, just because the, the processes are quite different from the way it is in the sack to the way it is in, in the um, fermentation tanks and also the temperature. Um, the pH is a little bit easier to control. Um, when we do the fermentation processes, when we were experimenting to start with, we did a two-day sack ferment, a three-day, four-day, five-day, six days. We did quite a few to see. And obviously, the longer it sits in, in the sack, the lower the, the pH goes. So sometimes, if you take it out of the, the sack after four, five, six days, and you put it in the, the fermentation tanks, it's already below a pH of four, which that at point, you basically immediately remove it from the fermentation tanks and go right to the, the drying beds. So we try and do with the two day fermentation I was speaking about earlier, it comes out of the, the, the bags around 4.4, 4.35, somewhere in there. Then it ferments for 
12 hours in the fermentation tanks with the water to get down to about four pH. Um, so we kind of measure at the very end and we measure when it comes out of the sack. When it's in the sack, we leave it to sit, obviously for two days without opening it. So the pH changes in the sack. We don't monitor that as it's changing because we leave the sacks closed for the two days. So that kind of, I guess, speaks to both questions. Maybe, yeah. just to say, I guess that you can really check it at the end more than the beginning. Absolutely. We're running a little bit short on time. We'll do one more question for all the other questions that didn't get answered. Please feel free to reach out to us. My email address is taylor at cropster.com and I can direct them to uh, either our guests or someone at Nordic Approach and help you out. Um, this last question we'll do, um, it's on the topic of cupping. Um, maybe this would be good for Morton um, or Dima. Um, the question is, do the flavors change a lot when the fermented coffees are very fresh at origin compared to when the coffees are rested and arrived to the roasters? And if so, how do they change? I think that's a great question. I can maybe start answering that and uh, then Dima can continue if he wants. Um, no, definitely. So at least, you know, like the way I look at it now and from our experience now, it's harder to to cup and evaluate uh, these kind of uh, fermented coffees uh, when they're fresh rather than the, the traditional ones. Um, and at least in my opinion, it tends to be, you know, like the processed uh, flavors are very, very kind of uh, predominant in the beginning. Um, and then as the coffee rests, you know, like they develop more of the, what they might call the terroir and, you know, like the, the kind of more complex flavors of what the coffee is, you know, like in the first place, the varieties and the, the other stuff. So definitely, I think it's more challenging to cup them when they're fresh uh, than uh, other coffees. Uh, but, you know, like you get custom to that as well. And then you start, you know, like you, 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 when you know a little bit what to look for, at least in my opinion, then it's manageable. But uh, yes, it's uh, kind of challenging. Dima, any, any concluding thoughts there? Uh, hello. Uh, uh, the, usually you need to understand which country you have because uh, it's different changes between the countries. If you speak about the like uh, dry climate countries, uh, it's like Ethiopian is uh, not change a lot, but sometimes in Colombia, uh, it's changed a lot because uh, they move the coffee from the altitude to altitudes. And usually they do it in sisal bags and the water activity and the water content change a lot in Colombia, for example, because it's rainy seasons and also with Indonesia. Yeah, but if you have a dry climate country, it's not change a lot. But the first rule what I uh, learned after 30 times uh, when I've been in uh, producing countries and buy the coffee as a green buyer, after 30 times, I understand that when I buy the coffee, I just minus two points uh, when it arrives and all, <laughs> all will be good. So not judging the coffee uh, super high because the expectation can be higher than the reality later. And usually it happens with uh, uh, different stuff. Uh, because, um, and then uh, you have a lot of like expectation to buy the coffee during the, uh, through the like traders. And when the coffee is arrived, they said, what the fuck, why it's changed so much? But usually it's changing, guys. You not buy the coffee after one month uh, after the harvest. You buy the coffee and you will use it after then uh, land it in Europe. And uh, it's your work. Uh, have a, make a prognosis how it can be after three months after harvesting and two months after landing the coffee. And uh, that is a green buyer uh, like topic, what you need to learn. And usually the coffee changing uh, really a lot. Uh, after like uh, landed in Europe, uh, especially in uh, from the high humid countries. So I mean, that's what I understood uh, uh, after 30 times being in uh, like uh, different uh, countries with different climates and uh, we have it in uh, our storage. Sometimes you buy the coffee, uh, 88, when it's landed in Russia is 86. And uh, that's uh, kind of, uh, you know, you never know how it can change. And so for example, like Ethiopia, usually not changing a lot for it because it's dry climate. But Colombia, for example, is changing a lot. That's my opinion. Thank you so much. Well, that concludes our webinar today. Thank you so much for the participants. Thank you for the producers and the roasters for helping 
and thank you so much for everybody who joined. Again, this will be on YouTube to view later on. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me directly. My email is taylor at cropster.com and I will direct your question to uh, whoever can help. Um, we have another webinar coming up on December 10th about rate of rise with Ann Cooper, so stay tuned for that on Cropster's end. Um, but thank you so much, uh, Nordic Approach. You guys were amazing in making this happen, and um, hopefully we can do something again together soon. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.